the Mughal Empire in India began in 1526 with Babar as its first emperor and ended in the 18th century with the defeat and subsequent exile of its last king, Bahudar Shah Zafar. The Mughal Empire was the latter offshoot of the Mongol Empire, which was established by the great Genghis Khan in 1206 in China, then known as Cathay. After the death of Genghis Khan, his empire split into four dynasties. The Turco-Mongol dynasty, better known as the Mughal Empire, Genghis Khan, who is also known for his barbaric expansionism, happened to be very tolerant in the matters of religion and equality towards all, so much so that his two sons had married Christian wives. Later in his dynasty, Kublai Khan had expressed his deep desire to learn about Christianity and became a Christian along with his vast empire that stretched from China to Europe. The 100 priests who had and invited to come and proselytize in his kingdom, never made it to his court, and this desire of the great emperor never materialized. The second half of the 16th century, during the reign of India's third and widely regarded as the greatest ruler of the Mughal dynasty, Jalal Uddin Muhammad Akbar, was also the time when the Europeans were becoming increasingly present on the Indian subcontinent. Especially active among them were the Portuguese, after reaching India with the expedition of Vasco da Gama in 1498. The Portuguese conquered many territories from Goa to Cambay Gulf. The Portuguese not only had established a monopoly in trade and expansion in the region, but also in spreading Christianity. As the Catholic missionaries and Jesuit priests started arriving in India, the diocese of Goa was established in 1534. The Jesuit missionaries started distributing food, items, and other necessities of life among the natives, thus practicing Christianity instead of preaching. Over a thousand miles away from Goa was the throne of the great Mughal king, Jalal Uddin Muhammad Akbar, in the empire's capital, Fatahpur Sikri Agra. Though Akbar himself was not a literate man, he was very fond of learning and patronizing arts and culture. Akbar was very tolerant towards people of different faiths in his vast kingdom, and in this very context, he promulgated his ideology of a common religion that would enshrine the basic human values based on tolerance and mutual respect amongst people of all faiths and communities. He called this new religion as Deen e Ilahi, meaning the religion of God. It was also known as Deen e Akbari, meaning both the religion of Akbar and the greater religion. Thus, we may say that Akbar was a pioneer of the interfaith dialogue and intercommunal harmony in India to promote this ideology of a common religion for all humanity, or at least for his empire. He also built an Ibadat Khana, meaning a house of worship. He did not call it a mosque, a church, a temple, or a gurdwara, but Ibadat Khana. The purpose of this Ibadat Khana was to let people of every faith come and pray or mediate in their own way and also hold religious and spiritual conversations on different faiths and religious traditions. Akbar wanted to learn from all religions and promote healthy conversations amongst learned people in matters of religion. Akbar's personal dictum of spirituality and religion was Sulei Kul. That is, peace towards all. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Luke 2.14, peace among those with who he is pleased, and Hebrews 12.14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. To further this noble cause, not only did Akbar abolish the ancient Islamic practice of levying the religion tax called Jizaya on the non-Muslims, but also allowed them to build their own house of worship. Following this degree came up the first church in Lahore, in 1597 and the second one in Agra in 1598. The Ibadat Khan experiment, however, did not go well as it failed to yield the results that Akbar had hoped for. The Muslims, Ulma's religious scholars, often got engaged in heated dogmatic debates and arguments amongst themselves that sometimes it became necessary for the guards of their premise to intervene lest they end up physically harming one another. Akbar expressed his displeasure at the conduct of the Muslim religious scholars the so-called ulamas, meaning scholars and mullahs, by saying, I have never tolerated any man who takes pride about himself in any matter whatsoever. And here I see these religious scholars arguing about their superiority over the other in matters of religion and piety. I will have none of this any further. With this proclamation, he shut down the Ibadat Khanna, at least for the time being. After closing this house of worship, Akbar decaled himself as Iman e Adel meaning and suggesting that he himself will act as the one who provides justices and equity to all his people. Akbar became so much disappointed and disillusioned with 
this whole idea of seeking common grounds between his traditional Islamic faith with other religious belief systems, that he now turned to seek the teachings of Christian faith in order to satisfy his quest for a better understanding of spirituality. The Church of Akbar, in his new discovered quest to learn about Christianity, the king invited Jesuit priests from Goa, a state in western India. Christianity in Goa has pre-Portuguese roots. The Portuguese conquered Goa in 1510. Christianity here is believed to be spread by St. Thomas and or St. Bartholomew who preached in the Malabar and Konkan coast, respectively. On the invitation of the King Akbar, Father Rudolf Aquiu, Father Antoine de Montserrat, and Father Francis Henriquez reached Agra in 28 February 1580. Prior to this, Akbar had established a contact with a Christian mission in Goa in 1578, and then again in 1579. However, a real and meaningful association only took place in 1580, with the arrival of the three above mentioned priests. The delegation from Goa arrived on the 28th of February, and two days later met with the king on the 3rd of March. The king was presented with the gift of an eight-volume Bible that was specially sent by the King Philip II of Spain and Portugal. It is reported that King Akbar received the gift with much humility and devotion as he kissed and held each volume over his head in reverence and veneration. The local religious scholars witnessed all this in utmost disbelief and displeasure. Then the king inquired of the delegation, which one of these is the Injil Gospels. The priests pointed to the volumes of the Gospels, and the king repeated the act with even more adoration and veneration, only to further annoyance of the Islamic religious scholars presented in the court. The king was also presented Christian iconography with paintings of Jesus and Mary and other religious murals and wall tapestries. On listening to the stories of Jesus' life and his miracles, Akbar ordered his palace artists to draw and paint them in their own way. Akbar adorned his palace and his court with all these paintings and murals depicting Christian and religious traditions. Akbar learned about the fundamentals of Christianity and gave land to Jesuit fathers to build a church in Agra. This was the first Roman Catholic church in the Mughal Empire. Later on, the church was demolished by Emperor Shah Jahan in 1635 after he captured Jesuit priests crossing religious limits of Islam and agreed to release them only if they demolished the church. Remember, Shah Jahan was the king who built the Taj Mahal for his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal. The church was rebuilt in 1636 by the permission of the emperor after he granted pardon to the Jesuit priests. First Holy Mass was celebrated in the church on 8 September 1636. In 1761, in the aftermath of the Third Battle of Panipat, the church was looted by Afghan invaders under Ahmed Shah Abdali. In 1769, however, the church was rebuilt by Father Wendell. Akbar named his third son Daniel, which is the rendition of Daniel of the Bible. Not only this, but the responsibility of education and upbringing of Daniel was entrusted to the Christian priest, Father Monserrato. However, the constant displeasure and disapproval of the core religious scholars kept Akbar confused and reluctant about making any ultimate decisions about his faith. Another important impediment in the way towards embracing Christian faith for Akbar was his practice of polygamy, which Islam permits but Christianity condemns. Therefore, being completely disillusioned and confused about the whole matter, Akbar began to incline towards Sufism or mysticism. With that also was shattered the hopes of the Jesuit priests of seeing an Asian king become another Constantinople. The priest left the king's court with a heavy heart and with no hope of ever returning to meet the king. Rudolf Aquivia was the last Jesuit priest to leave Fatah Pur Sikr Agra in 1583. However, this did not prove to be the final adios, as Akbar could neither accept nor reject Christianity. Thus, once again in 1590, Akbar wrote to the Christian mission of, of Goa to visit him. Once again in 1591, two priests and one layman came to the king's court. The end result was still the same. How did this strange romance of King Akbar finally end? Before we get to that, there is a story that has been left buried somewhere in the unexplored archives of the forgotten pages of history. Since Akbar's relationships with Christianity remained mainly with the church in Goa, a renewed history of Goa. Luis de Assis Correa, in his book Portuguese, India, and Mughal Relations, unveils this most fascinating story. Correa writes that one of the major reasons for Akbar's profound interest in Christianity was that one of his wives was a Christian. As we have seen that soon after Vasco de Gama's expedition to India in 1489, Alfonso de Albuquerque conquered the state of Goa in 1510. About half a century later, in 1558, two sisters, Juliana Macaranos and Dona Maria, began their journey from Lisbon, Portugal, to Goa. These two sisters were heading to Goa to be caretakers of the orphans of the Portuguese soldiers who had fallen in the war in the Indian Peninsula. The ship in which these two ladies were traveling was attacked by pirates and both sisters were abducted and later to the efforts of the Sultan of Gujarat, Bahadur Shah, was set free and then sent to the court 
of King Akbar, the king took Donna Maria as his wife, and the other sister who was a doctor as his family physician. It's often believed that the mother of Jani Gur was Yoda Bai, also famously known as Marian Azamani. However, according to Afano's research, it was Donna Maria who was the real mother of Jahangir. Now, why was this big secret kept so veiled and hidden? The reason is that since later it was the British who toppled and ended the Mughal Empire. Having a Christian as a mother of a prominent king of the dynasty was a matter of shame. Moreover, the stark differences between Christianity and Islam and the pressures from the court religious scholars prevented the king to make this matter public. However, this is no secret that it was Jahangir who patronized Christianity more than any other Mughal emperors did. His palace had many Christian iconography displaced all over. Jahangir supported many Christian missions and even sponsored building many churches across the Mughal Empire in India. Back to Akbar and how his story ended with regards to Christianity. In 1603, Akbar issued a proclamation that Christianity can be openly preached in India and there will be no restrictions on conversion to Christianity. Islam does not permit change to any other religion as death is a punishment for apostasy. Later on, three grandsons of King Akbar got baptized. But since in Mughal tradition there was no concept of appointing a crown prince, the next king was mostly decided with the wars of succession and this is how the Game of Thrones was played out. One reason for this was that the kings followed polygamy and had multiple wives, leaving every wife with a mission and passion to see her son as the next king. Thus the grandsons of the king had to revert their ancestral religion of Islam to be able to call qualify for the race to the throne. The Akbar never formally accepted Christianity, yet there was something about Christianity that he was never able to put it behind him and move on. It is reported that the last call to Christianity Akbar made was in 1594, again to the mission in Goa in 1605 when Akbar was on his deathbed at the age of 63. There were still a few Jesuit priests nearby. They tried to approach the king in his final moments, but were barred from meeting him. The king passed away without proclaiming his faith in Christ. What would he have said or done? If the Jesuit priests had been allowed to meet him in private in his dying moments, what must have been going in his heart as he bid farewell to this world? We do not have any answers to these questions. It is possible the king in the heart of his heart had accepted Jesus as his savior. No one can say anything in this regard, but since only God knows the hearts and the innermost thoughts, the reluctant convert, King Akbar left the world without publicly accepting the Lord. But who knows, the Lord may have accepted him. Who are we to judge? But what about us? We who profess our faith in the Lord, can we say, I know that the Lord has accepted me in his kingdom? Akbar had run out of his time, but we still have ours. Can we say, I know Jesus has accepted me in his kingdom? The story of Akbar's church. To all visitors, Agra is a Mughal city, with the Taj Mahal as its focal point. Visiting the city to see a facet that is not Mughal may sound a bit like sacrilege. Not quite especially when the structure in question happens to be a church built during the reign of the Mughals. In the city of Agra, while bearing ample evidence of having once been the Mughal imperial capital, also has a Christian face that is somewhat obscure. The most significant Christian building in the city bears the somewhat enigmatic name of Akbar's church. The story of this church dates back to February 18, 1580, on which date a delegation of three Jesuit priests reached Agra for one audience with Emperor Akbar. Portuguese fathers Rodolfo Aquia, Antoine de Montserrat, and Francis Henriquez had made the long and difficult journey from Goa to Agra. Basis historical accounts, Akbar's curiosity about different religions had caused him to invite priests from Goa. The enthusiasm of the Holy Fathers was high as they felt Akbar himself would convert, which would open the entire country to conversion. While the priests were received with respect by the emperor, he never converted. The emperor often held debates between the priests and the indigenous religious scholars at court. Father Monstrati moved on, but the faith preached by these early Jesuits left behind his mark in Agra. Merchants and travelers from France, Portugal, Holland, and Italy, etc. flocked to the imperial capital. Conversion to Christianity among locals also took place, adding to the numbers. Over time, Akbar granted land near an existing Armenian settlement for the first church to come up. This is the site where the Akbar's church, originally built in 1598, stands today. According to the historian R.V. Smith, the festival of Christians would see the emperor and his nobles come to the church in the morning, followed by ladies of the harem and young princes in the evening. It is in this period of religious experimentation that the first nativity plays in India were staged, with Europeans playing a part within, often with the emperor as the audience. The practices begun in Akbar's reign continued in that of Jahangir, 
Gradually, the play grew in scale and became better organized, with rehearsals taking place in an area called Bloody Dacme. Dacme was reached in 1610, when three of Jengar's nephews were baptized in the church. Shah Jahan's conflict with the Portuguese halted imperial patronage temporarily, along with many of the defeated Portuguese. Jesuit fathers were also persecuted. Their release in 1635 was subject to the church being pulled down, which was done only to be reconstructed in 1636 at the same site. The next blip in the life of the church came when Ahmad Shah Abdali's troops ransacked the place in 1769. However, it found another patron in the form of the European adventurer Walter Reinhardt, who helped to rebuild and extend the church. His wife, later known as Begum Samru, was probably baptized in the church. Rapid increase in the congregation led to the construction of a new church in 1848. This building, standing close to Akbar's church and dominating what is now a large complex of church buildings, is the imposing Cathedral of Immaculate Conception, possessing a Baroque exterior at its front. The cathedral from within resembles a magnified version of Akbar's church, with the same curved ceiling effect. The difference between the two places of worship being the altar. The cathedral today serves as the seat of the Catholic establishment in Agra. Protestant churches also began to be built at the same time. The oldest of these is the Church of St. John in the Wilderness, located in Sikandra, also called Mission Church. It also has a Mughal era connect, albeit an indirect one. In the colonial era, the church precincts encompass large swaths of the land around, including the nearby tomb of Akbar's consort, Maryam Zamani, around 1838. Missionaries began an orphanage and school within the tomb building for children orphaned in a terrible famine in the northwest frontier and undivided Punjab, a strange interwining of church history with Mughal heritage.